Well, it began almost three months ago. On December 8th of this past year, 2022, there was a news article that caught my attention and it shook me to the core due to its graphic nature and the heartbreak behind the headline. 65 years later, the boy in the box has a name. A story that many of you may be familiar with if you're of an older generation or if you grew up in the area. In 1957, in Northeast Philadelphia, a presumed four to six year old boy was found beaten to death in a cardboard box. And while suspicions ran high, no conviction was ever made. And this poor child went unidentified for 65 years until recent advances in forensic DNA and genealogy techniques were able to determine whose family he came from and what his name was. Rest in peace still, Joseph Augustus Zarelli. While there is still no answer on who was responsible, there's at least some peace in giving identity to who this poor child was all along that struck with struck me it's a haunting thing to think about how we grieve over or even rejoice for those that we don't even know i think of the famous tomb of the unknown soldier in washington dc a tomb highly regarded meant to signify the many who were lost to war and never confirmed. Or, even in happier times, when with a newborn baby, a couple doesn't decide on a name for days until they're certain. And there's that excitement. People will perpetually ask, what will you call her? The point is that names always matter. We yearn to know and identify who we all are and what our name tells us, tells others about us, whether that might be where you're from, who our family was, what we like, what we stand for, who we're married to. You can't claim that names don't matter because even to the one who doesn't correct someone when their name is mistakenly mispronounced, or maybe you know someone that might shrug it off and say, eh, you know, you can call me whatever. If that situation played out, if someone purposely called someone something different every single day, if I at first acknowledged you as Jeff, and then Matt, and then Andre, and then Steve, each day you would feel distant Eventually, you'd feel aggravated. You'd feel unknown, unseen. Nowadays, there are countless embarrassing stories online of how situations played out when people realized that they'd been calling someone by the wrong name for a while. So what about the name of God? Have you thought much at all? about what you should or should not say when referring to our creator and the sustainer of life. I distinctly remember the first time that somebody called me out for this very carelessness. And it's had a profound impact on my approach to prayer ever since. I was 12-ish years old at the time, jumping on a trampoline with my friends and they did something very cool, and I said, oh my God. And what my friend's reaction was, the older brother's reaction, stung me so badly that it stuck with me to this day. He said, what did you say? Don't ever take the Lord's name in vain. 
And what he was quoting was Exodus 20, verse 7, which says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does that mean? The word vain can mean empty, worthless, nothing, to no good purpose. What it means is we are forbidden from bearing the name in a manner that's wicked or worthless or to no good purpose. So we're not to use the name in empty or false oaths, things that we don't intend to carry out. Very often you'll hear people swearing by the name of God. I found myself getting quite irritated when some of my students would perpetually say, oh yeah, put it on God, bro, put it on God. Or over simple things. I swear to God I didn't take your cake. I swear. It also prohibits a false vision or false prophecies. It explicitly calls out in Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 27, such prophesy lies in my name. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Well, how long shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies and deceit out of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for idols. Not taking the Lord's name in vain. While this is nowhere near as common of scripture as something like the Lord's Prayer, or perhaps you know Psalm 23, maybe you know John 3.16. I'd wager to bet, though, that more people have heard this warning than they might realize because it's included in the Ten Commandments. This is a list that as much as some might scoff and mock it, it is almost entirely still respected by a court of law and societal morals to this day, that even in a secular environment, this practice for having reverence and respect for someone's name or title, it's expected. When you're in a situation where you're meeting with somebody with greater authority, you respect their name. If I dared walk into a job interview, how do you think that'd go? Or consider the president in the United States, someone who serves four years, but we refer to them as the president for the rest of their life. The title sticks with them. Not taking the Lord's name in vain is the third commandment. What that tells me is that it is the third most important rule to follow. In God's eyes, that's a greater offense than murder. Greater offense than adultery, theft. These are all things that would be detestable to anyone with a shred of character. Murder is held up as the ultimate sin in a country that abides by law and order. But yet, according to the Ten Commandments, it's only the sixth most egregious offense in a world where there is, in fact, a present and powerful God. And you cannot shrug off and say boo, boo, boo to the Ten Commandments if you will also then hold sacred and teach your children the golden rule. As you would hear them say, treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. That's what Jesus said was the summation of the back half of the Ten Commandments. 
being asked in Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, our society has been more than pleased to run that in reverse order for some time now. Loving ourselves first, then having regard for our fellow man, and even less so for a God that we cannot yet see or touch. But I advise you to check your ego at the door. Because without God, there is no hope whatsoever in this world. And when left up to our own devices, we will become no better than the beasts of the field. Based on survival where murder and theft would be commonplace. Without any regard for consequence, man would just do what is right in their own eyes. Now, I cannot speak for some of you. I cannot speak for those who've not been loved in their lives. I can't speak for those of you who might feel so disconnected from the thought of a higher power that would intervene on their behalf. But with what weight I can offer from this platform, I want to insist on my very breath that there is a powerful God who is with us in all that we do, who loves you, who wants you to know him, and wants you to have a relationship with him. And we will be accountable to him for how we treat his name and how we treat our fellow man. So it does us good to recognize what we can and cannot control and to at least esteem some respect for a God if there is one. And that respect starts with his name and what he told his servant Moses to call him. In Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God that is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting even the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The context of this verse was Moses requesting to know God by more than just title, but in the truest sense. This comes from Exodus 33, where Moses said, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you've said, I know you by name, and you've also found favor in my sight. Well, now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. God then replies that he will proclaim his name, the Lord, to Moses. And that is where you get the explanation from Exodus 34. The Hebrew word that Moses is getting at when he says to know is yada, which means in the deepest sense to be able to distinguish, to be able to discriminate, and to be fully acquainted with someone. In our 20th century Western culture, personal names are little more than labels to distinguish one person from another. Sometimes even nicknames are chosen which tell us something about the person, 
Hey, there's Skinny Sam. But even this is a poor reflection of the significance of names in the Bible. Unfortunately to many, the names God or Lord convey little more than designations of a supreme being. They're just common titles. It says little to them about God's character, his ways, what God means to each of us as a human being. But in scripture, the names of God are like little miniature portraits and promises. It's beautiful. In scripture, a person's name identified them. It stood for something specific. And this is especially true of God himself. Naming carried special significance. It was a sign of authority. It was a sign of power. It was a sign of divine blessing. And this is evident in the fact that God revealed his names to the people instead of having them choose them for him. This is also seen in the fact that God often changed the names of his people when he changed their plan. From Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, and from Jacob to Israel. The lesson that we can glean from this is trying to maintain a deeper reverence for God by approaching him with purpose. This is because God's name is synonymous with his character. You look at a verse like Numbers 14, 21, where it says, As truly as I live, and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, that glory being what Moses was asking to see, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I'm going to show you my name. Well, that verse means that he intends to fill the earth with people, people who would wish to be reflections of him. This is telling us that he is calling people to take on his name, to mold their characters to be like him and to be like his son, Jesus, whose name happens to mean God is salvation. So with his name, the Lord, a God of mercy, truth. He is saying, I am mercy. I am grace. I am truth. And if you value these things, then you should value and respect my name. There are many names and titles of God depending on what's being conveyed. Elohim, Yahweh, El Shaddai. But we can't get into an exhaustive study for the sake of time tonight. But this is all information that is easily obtained in any concordance or for your convenience if you visit the website Blue Letter Bible. But what came first? The first name is Elohim, as in God, the creator. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. That's Genesis 1, verse 1. The word El is used for God about 238 times, while Elohim is used about 2,600 times. This name is used in scripture when emphasizing God's might, his creative power, and his attributes of justice and rulership. We commonly think of it as a reference to the manifestation of God through his angels. And some of the variations on this include Eloha, El Elyon, and El Shaddai 
which translates to God Almighty or God the All-Sufficient One. It is only God identifying his name as Yahweh in Exodus 3, verses 13 through 15, when Moses says to God, If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And that includes you and me now. In hindsight, we first see the name of the one true God first recorded in Genesis 2 verse 4, properly where it says, In the day that the Lord God created, Yahweh Elohim is how that reads. Yahweh is the most commonly used name in the scriptures, ringing in at about 6,800 times as compared to Elohim only 2,600 times. You also have references to Adonai, 439 times, and El, 238 times. Yahweh was often found in the scriptures simply as the consonants, Y-H-W-H. This was known as the Tetragrammaton, or God's holy covenant name which literally translates, I am who I am. And it also translates to mean, I will be who I will be, or the self-existent one. Interestingly, in Exodus 6, verse 3, God speaking to Moses says, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. The very first time that Abraham speaks unto God in Genesis 15, verse 2, he says, Adonai Yahweh. And this is how the Hebrews mainly knew and addressed God up until the exodus and the deliverance from Egypt as Adonai, or El Shaddai, El Elyon, God, Lord, Almighty, even the Most High God. But these were simply titles. And while they did have plenty of reverence, there was not a personal aspect attached until God made it known unto Moses. Because then Yahweh was not just a title. But it was more of a description of who God was and his role as the Redeemer of Israel and of you and I. That's not often something that we see or something that we hear. All throughout the Bible, if I pull it up any page right now or if I pull it up on an app, I'm going to see Lord, Lord, Lord or God. Rarely in English is it ever translated Yahweh. Why? To understand how Lord came to be used as a translation of Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, we must give some attention to the Greek word krios, a Greek adjective meaning having power or authority. It appears 748 times used as a noun. Often it means Lord, Sovereign, Master, Owner. The New Testament texts that have been available to modern biblical scholars use Krios, Lord, 
and occasionally they use theos, as in theology, God, whenever they go back and they quote the Old Testament in which YHWH would appear. The problem, though, is that Theos, which appears 1,340 times, is defined as a deity of the Trinity doctrine, or falsely, all three gods of the Trinity. Hmm. What I find is very interesting and very important for us to focus on is the extreme reverence for the name of God that the Jews had and how they interpreted the third commandment, not taking the Lord's name in vain. You see, Jews both were and are extremely particular and they do not casually write any name of God. Judaism does not prohibit the writing of a name of God per se, but it prohibits erasing or defacing a name of God. However, extremely observant Jews will avoid writing any name of God casually because of the risk simply that the written name might later be defaced, obliterated, destroyed accidentally by one who does not know better. Jewish scribes often distinguished the divine name by writing YHWH in ancient Hebrew script while using the remainder of the verse written in a more modern or Aramaic type script, which purposely caused it to stand out. Sometimes they'd even take it a step further and just write four dots for the sacred name being felt apparently that Yahweh was so sacred that it should not even be written. And in addition, when they read it out loud, they didn't say the actual name of Yahweh, but instead inserted Adonai or read out, Lord, out loud Lord, much in the same way that we do when if reading through the scriptures in the KJV, you see Holy Ghost, we would properly say Holy Spirit for the sake of proper understanding. So these very strict traditional practices suggest that to the Jews, the personal name of God was such a holy and special word that it required special treatment, both in writing and speaking. And you'd contrast that with Sadly, the attitude of the world that we live in now where people question whether there's a God at all. Why would that matter? Why is that really important? There was an article written in 1978 by George Howard, who was an associate professor of religion and Hebrew at the University of Georgia. The article was for biblical archaeology, and his primary thesis was that the earliest Gospels, although they were written in Greek, they used the Hebrew tetram tetragrammaton of YHWH to represent the name of God, but that this changed over the course of time due to the mass infusion of the Gentiles into the first century Ecclesia. Although initially the predominantly Jewish group had been able to preserve the custom of writing God's name in veiled symbols, the special treatment of God's name over time began to decline. And Gentile scribes who lacked any familiarity with Hebrew writing could hardly be expected to preserve Yahweh, especially when it was in a coded form with archaic dots, script. 
So Professor Howard speculates that perhaps this contributed to the copier's use of substitutes like Krios and Theos as more and more New Testament manuscripts were created and that the Hebrew name gradually was phased out in both the Septuagint and the New Testament by the end of the first century. So the conclusion of this is that the removal of Yahweh from the New Testament and its replacement with Krios blurred the original distinction between the Lord God and the Lord his son Jesus the Christ. Krios thenceforth was pressed into double duty. Lord, Lord, as the standard title of both Jesus as well as the New Testament equivalent of Yahweh. So in many passages, it's ambiguous as to which one is meant. And if you are not aware of the distinction, you can see how easy it would be to assume wrongly that they were one and the same. Therefore, it may be that the removal of the tetra tetragrammaton of YHWH from the New Testament directly contributed to the development of the false doctrine of a trinity and obscuring the doctrine of true God manifestation. So while it is a strong possibility that the watering down of the proper use of the reverent name of God may have directly led to a misunderstanding of God's true nature and purpose, what we can be sure of is that the lack of respect for any name of God now directly affects our relationship with the divine. Because we're explicitly told in scripture everywhere that the name of the Lord is to be exalted in the highest possible terms. Almost any page you turn to, that will be the case. You could literally flip through any of the Psalms, and it'll be a repeat of just these few examples. But just to give you a few easy ones to start with, pull up Psalm 8. It opens and ends, verse 1 and verse 9, with this term, Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. A couple pages over in Psalm 29, David continues to write, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. And worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And if you know the Lord's Prayer, then you already knew this. In Matthew 6, verse 9, Jesus teaching us to pray starts with this phrase. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, of course, I've heard people say, it doesn't bother me. You know, I... I hear it all the time. You know, you should work where I work. You should hear the things that they say around, around my work. Taking the Lord's name in vain is no big deal. Don't kid yourself. It is a big deal. It bothers God. And if it bothers God, it should bother you. It should bother you the most if you're a believer. It should bother you if you are a worshiper and are actively seeking to manifest his name and the mold of his son, Jesus. It should bother you even if you do not yet have that deep level of connection and commitment. It should bother you just from the idea that there should be at least something 
something that's considered polite and sacred. In our moral society, in polite conversation. And in fact, if you would condemn murder and you would seek justice for theft, adultery, justice for murder, or if you abhorred openly lying as a false witness, then you should check your moral compass and understand that what would prevent those kind of things in the first place is if a mind is cultivated by the word of God. And if there was first a respect and a fear for his holy name, then perhaps not taking the Lord's name in vain would be an easy way to avoid somebody that might commit theft or murder. So why I would suggest strongly making the effort to eliminate the phrase OMG from your life. You know, I can't go in any kind of polite place and drop the N-word without getting a lot of strong and justified reactions. I can't go and use any kind of derogatory slang that I want, taking something else in vain, respecting someone's culture, their race, their identity. How have we lost the ability to have a respect for God's name? If you're saying that you're desensitized to it, or you're glossing it over, then this is what you need to hear. If you're ever hearing someone say, OMG, or callously taking the Lord's name in vain, it should sting your conscience. You should feel offended. I know it's not easy to like, think that you have to confront somebody about it, but your own reaction matters first to God. How you care about his name says how he should care about your nature. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus 24, the punishment for blaspheming the name was to be stoned to death. You can look this up in a longer account. But in Leviticus 24, this was God's own will. Just looking at verses 15 and 16, and speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. While we no longer have the punishment of death as a consequence, the principle of cultivating a mind that respects its maker and building a community where reverence is the currency is always going to be more beneficial. So just some things I'd like to look at in conclusion. We're told that we will be judged by our words. In Matthew 12, verses 33 to 37, it says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. But the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. And I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. So Yahweh is explicitly warning us against using his name flippantly as if it were disconnected from his person, his presence, his power, his mercy. Because it is in the name of the Lord that we have a hope of life. So why the silly title that I gave it? Hopefully that gets your attention. 
by the name, name, name of God. Well, that came from Revelation 4, verse 8, where it prophesies that the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Because in contrast to how the English reads, in Hebrew, a word or phrase that was repeated is meant to build onto itself, almost like multiplication. Such as when Christ often says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Well, the Greek for that is veritas. Veritas means truth, truly. So when Christ said that, it was not just truly, truly, I say unto you, but what Christ was saying was, Of the truest truth, I say unto you. Therefore, when it refers to the Lord God Almighty as holy, 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 it is in reference to the holiest of holies beyond even what we understand holy to be. That is the Lord. Therefore, we ought to give respect for his name. So in conclusion, I, I insist, call upon his name. Call upon his name. Call on him in joy. Call on him in heartbreak. In anxiety and confusion. Call upon the name of God in frustration or in helplessness. Call upon his name in admiration and praise. But consider your motivations and consider your emotions if you ever catch yourself taking it in vain. Thank you.